All right, hey, what's up everybody? And thank you for listening to Operation Agency Freedom, where we are bringing you top secret advice from the world's most badass digital agency owners, sometimes twice. These amazing men and women are sharing their stories of how they have built six, seven, and eight figure digital agencies, and how you can too. My name is Chris Martinez, CEO of Dude, where we help digital agencies by giving them the people and processes so they can take on more website and funnel projects and scale profitably. Today, I am joined by Ralph Burns, founder and CEO of Tier 11. Welcome back to the show, Ralph. <laughs> Good to talk to you again. <laughs> Great to be back, Chris, uh, yeah. even though this is my first time on. <laughs> well, let's just be honest. I was <laughs> stupid the first time, and I forgot to hit the record button. It's like our 50th show or something, and I knew it was going to happen, and you were the lucky recipient of my stupidity. So I appreciate you coming back. Well, I like the transparency, you know? Hey, you know, sometimes you fuck up in life, and yeah. uh, hey, that's the, <laughs> you got to be able to overcome those uh, screw-ups and move on, and here we are, no less than what, like? Seven days later, we figured it out and yeah, uh, man. happy to be back on the show or on the show for the first time. I'm not sure which it is, but uh, great to be here. And thanks for yeah. having me on. Well, I was so excited about our interview the first time that I was, that's why I was so bummed that I didn't hit the record button. Uh, but I, you've got a lot of good stuff to share. So like, let's jump right into it. And of course, we start off every session with our roundtable discussion. And um, we had a great talk last time and now we can finally share it with the world. You have been fired from a few jobs. I have been fired from many jobs. The one that we talked about before that I would love you to tell that story again is the salad place. You were working <laughs> at the salad place. I'm sure it was just like a lifelong goal to be a college graduate and working at a salad making store. Um, mm -hmm. And they ended up letting you go. So tell us that story. Yeah, well, today is actually is a good day. And it's, you know, we couldn't have said this the first time we recorded, but today is actually the 10th anniversary of my last firing. Oh, wow. So it's kind of a big day here. So Operation Freedom, you know, like, hey, you, this you have is it. The, uh, we got it. So I refer to this as Liberation Day. So that was the final day that I was actually, I worked for the man, worked for a Fortune 500 company. That was the third time I was fired. So, uh, you know, if you're a corporate misfit and like realize that <laughs> the corporate world isn't exactly for you, there is life after the corporate world. You can't actually start your own company and be successful at it. But the first time I was fired, I was fired from, um, <laughs> I think it was the first job I had after college. I was living rent free down on Cape Cod, which is actually where I live right now. I'm in Massachusetts, but I can't believe my buddy Warren allowed, uh, his parents allowed us three or four four of us, four college graduates to live rent free at this beautiful home in Cape Cod. Of course, none of us really wanted to work all that much. We just wanted to hang around and drink beer. But um, I ended up, did, I did get a job. I believe I was the first of our four of my four friends actually to get a job as a salad chef at um, the Landfall restaurant, which everybody now refers to as the Landfill restaurant. But anyway, Landfall restaurant. So uh, I had that job as a salad chef. I had a really shitty car. It was the shit brown Omni uh, that I bought for $700. And sometimes it would start, sometimes it wouldn't. On one particular day, I was starting up or trying to start up the shit brown Omni to get to my salad chef job. which My parents were very, very proud of spending four years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in an education to become a salad chef after college, uh, the car wouldn't start. And um, as much as I tried, I couldn't start it. We had all these techniques. We'd like bang on the motor and do all kinds of other things. It wouldn't start. <laughs> and um, so I called my boss and I said, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it into work today. He's like, you either get your ass into work or you're fired. And so I was like, Okay, so I called around for taxis and I realized that a taxi cab ride there and back was more money that I would actually make on my shift. So I called him back and I said, sorry boss, not gonna make it. And he said, well, next time you come in here, you can pick up your last paycheck, you're fired. So that was a, uh, a precursor to two other corporate firings here, Chris, which uh, led to my ultimate freedom, which led to Liberation Day for 10 years. And here we are today in January of 2020, uh, much happier than I was 
uh, today than I was that day that I got fired from the salad chef job. So isn't it isn't it funny how we remember those moments? <laughs> like I've had, you know, I've been working ever since I was 15 years old, and I'm 40 now. I rem- I don't remember any of the day to day really. You know, I would say 99.99% of the day to day of being in those jobs, I don't remember much. But I do remember the day that I've been fired, right? And I remember like the way that I felt, and I remember like the, I remember the weather, like I remember yeah, everything, yeah. yeah. Right? So and it's true. interesting because, you know, like at least for me, uh, I think for the majority of the reasons why I got fired was for mouthing off or like disciplinary reasons, and it's like I just didn't like to follow their rules. Yeah. Which as a as an owner, you know, you do need to break the rules. Especially like with, with what we're doing, there are no set forth rules. We have to create our own rules. So in many ways, we're breaking a lot of the, the norms and, and improving on them. But I, I think it's pretty so interesting, you know, that, that like, and, and, you know, just based on what I know of your personality and stuff, I think that you ha- because you had the courage to say, no, this doesn't make sense, in the, in the long run, it's made you a better business owner. I think so. I also understood that it was shitheads like me, you know, these guys were hiring. Like I was a, whatever (laughs) I was, 20 years old, 19 years old uh, at that time. And I'm like, wow, like retail really sucks. Like I never want to operate a retail store or a Mm -hmm. restaurant with like a 1% profit margin. And I always said that's sort of stuck in the back of my head. I mean, here I am, I'm, you know, I'm this kid. And the salads are, you know, delivery thereof is relying on me showing up for work. And I'm such an idiot. I don't even show up for work. I'm like, that model sucks. I never really wanted to get into that kind of business. Yeah, um, totally. Which is the reason why I went digital. And you probably did the same, you know? Well, you know what? So my, my, my first real W-2 job, I worked at Chuck E. Cheese when I was in high school. And I worked at the cash register. And looking back, I learned a ton about systems and operations from Chuck E. Cheese because I worked at other pizza places and they were not as meticulous about managing their food inventory. Um, So like at Chuck E. Cheese, if they were going to make a large pizza, they had a specific amount of weight of mushrooms, bell peppers, whatever it is that they, they had to weigh it out. It had to be exactly precise and then put it on the the pizza and the other pizza places that I worked at were didn't do anything anything close to that yeah so I mean now looking back and I'm like that was really really smart and then Chuck E. Cheese paid their managers incredibly well yeah and and actually there was like a lot of like logic tests that you had to to pass to uh, get hired on to be a store manager um so and I think that's that. just a window into like why Chuck E. Cheese is successful and why, you know, the corner sub shop maybe will never get to that level of scale. And I, I couldn't agree more. My, my youngest son, I know we eventually want to talk about agency stuff, but this is interesting. <laughs> yeah. My youngest son worked at McDonald's for like two years and uh-huh. he never ate the food there. He hated the food there. Um, he like would, you know, eat the, whatever it was, the McFlurry. That was the only thing that he ate. He didn't go there, but it was the only place that would hire him as a 14 year old. So he like, yeah. he had no choice and he could ride his bike there. It's not too far from where we live and all this other sort of stuff. And I'm like, make note of their systems. Like you're a smart, logical kid. Like he's he just got into Dartmouth. He's like a wow. super bright kid. I don't know where he got his intelligence from, quite honestly. Wow. Um, definitely on my wife's side. <laughs> the point is, I said, make note of that. Like systems and business are super important. And so whenever we would talk about like his day at McDonald's, he would talk about the systems. It's amazing, the systems. They have, you know, 14, 15, 16-year-old kids running multi-million dollar franchises because of great systems exactly what you're talking about with chuck e cheese so yep it's vital definitely can learn a lot from those those big companies they're obviously doing a lot right Mm -hmm, for sure well let's talk about your company now so tell us uh you know i want to hear the origin story for tier 11 i know that there was a there was your liberation day so why don't we start just before liberation day and then how you how you got to where you're at now Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why Liberation Day happened is that I had actually started an online business that uh, one of my coworkers found out about. And, uh, you know, a few steps back, uh, a couple of years prior to Liberation Day, uh, my wife gave me 
the four hour work week book from by Tim Ferriss on our ninth mm -hmm. wedding anniversary. And it was kind of a transformative thing. And whenever she says, read a book, she's, she reads hundreds of books every year. I think she read like 200 books last year, which is incredible to me. But um, so whenever she says, read this book, I read the book because it's usually pretty good. So I read this one um, and it totally changed my whole thinking. I mean, I can't say it changed my life. It did change my life. Let's call it what it is. But the point was, is in that book, people were actually making money online. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what is this thing on the internet? Like people are making money doing this and using VAs and there's this thing called pay-per-click advertising. I'm like, what? So I read that thing and I listened to it over and over again in my commute and I started listening to podcasts. And by the way, my wife got for ninth wedding anniversary, I gave her an ethernet cable, Chris. You guys just have romance exploding out of your house. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think I definitely got the better end of that deal. And we, it's funny thing. We actually found it in a drawer like about two months ago. Anyway, the point is, is so that mind that, that book just blew my mind. And I started listening to podcasts, understanding sort of this whole digital marketing, you know, internet marketing thing. And this is 2008, 2009. And, um, yeah, probably 2008 when I read the book, uh, since where liberation day was 2010. And I actually, started a blog like one of the things that tim ferris said as well you know start a blog and i started listening to internet business mastery with sterling and jay on the podcast on itunes and mm -hmm. and uh, they said create a business out of something that you know about i'm like well i'm a really good sales manager i actually really was i was a pretty good sales guy but i was a better manager better sales director so i created a a website that uh uh, I thought was brilliant and genius and would make millions for me one day called salesmanagementmastery.com. And, uh, you know, started sending pay-per-click advertising to it, this cool thing. I didn't realize like all my clicks were coming from like India and Asia and Singapore. And I'm like, wow, I've got like a list of 10,000 people on here. This is amazing. I'll create a product. So I created a product, a paid product for what I was doing, like as in, an, in addition to blogging and all the other sorts of things. And I launched it, bought, you know, product launch formula from Jeff Walker 2.0 version and, you know, bought it the very day it came out. You know, he, I, this whole like scarcity thing was all new to me. It was like fascinating. So I, I bought PLF 2.0, launched the thing and got exactly two sales. <laughs> So a massive, I, what a massive launch day. That's awesome. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. A guy from New Jersey and somebody from uh, Syria, I think bought for $67. So and I could never sell any of the stuff. I'm like it was my first lesson in business. It's like I created this big thing, never really tested whether or not people would buy. Mm -hmm. I've since sort of learned from that experience. Uh, so anyway, but I realized quickly that, you know, it wasn't necessarily the content I loved. It was the marketing of it that I loved, even though my launch was a total flop. I loved the idea of convincing people and, and influencing people through advertising. So that's when I sort of made this shift in my mind after getting fired. <laughs> I then said, okay, now I need to make money at this. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do if you have some sort of you know, competency for advertising, but don't have a product, you go into affiliate sales, which is what I started doing. So affiliate marketing, I, I did that for a couple of years, started making money, started spending, you know, upwards of six figures a month, actually over six figures, many, many months in a row uh, on paid traffic, on pay-per-click, Yahoo and Bing were sort of my big areas. And then Facebook advertising came out. And the targeting back then was pretty sucky. It was like, where do you live? You know, are you male, female? Are you yeah. interested in men, women, whatever? Where do you live? Like, you know, age range, that kind of thing. So I said, well, based on the targeting, this is really good for dating offers. So I became a super affiliate for a bunch of dating offers, Christian dating specifically. Why? I don't really know, but that was the offer that converted. And, um, then eventually everything sort of went south with the FTC and mm -hmm. like affiliate world. And I said, you know, I got to like reinvent myself. And a buddy of mine said, Hey, you want to, you were doing this for all these other offers that you don't know anything about. Why don't you do that for my business? So my first agency customer was a guy I met at a cocktail party. He sold uh, picture frames, like reframing pictures. <laughs> and he paid me a hundred bucks a month. And I did his SEO and I did his paid advertising 
and I managed the whole thing and I had him as a customer for about a year and a half, kind of went from there, um, eventually pivoted back to uh, all only Facebook advertising in about 2013 because the platform changed, as you know. Targeting got in there, really good targeting, obviously ads in the newsfeed and just started to scale up from there in 2014, 2015, uh, is when things really started to move and we've been growing ever since and here it is 2020 still doing the same thing Facebook and Instagram is the only platform that we advertise on as a full-service agency and uh, it's been a wild ride and we're gonna continue to grow and and look forward to uh, you know, helping people grow their businesses faster through those two mediums into the to the very very distant future that's awesome man you know what? I forgot to tell you this before and I don't know why I didn't think about it when you were talking about, you know, all the, your, your journey from affiliate marketer to agency owner. I actually had a program that I created and I did a similar launch to what you did. It was called Soccer Sports Betting Secrets. So I met this guy who uh, used to bet on professional soccer um, and in Europe and um, well, mainly Europe. And I, I can't even remember how I met him or whatever. And I was just fascinated because he was winning tens of thousands of dollars betting on soccer games. And so um, we basically, I, and I was learning about marketing and lead magnets and, and, you know, four hour work week and all this stuff too, about the same time that you were. And I was like, man, we can create this subscription based product where we sell people sports betting tips and we'll show them how to set up their accounts and all this other stuff. So we ended up running that. I, I, I mean, I think at the, the peak, it was doing like 700 a month in revenue. Um, 700 is <laughs> in $700. $700. 700, not 700 members. <laughs> $700 in revenue. Yeah. And, and the, <laughs> the worst part, I think it's, it's funny now, but it, you know, all these games that were in Europe, I mean, they start at like you know, 11 o'clock our time. Right. On, um, and I'm on the I'm on Pacific Coast time. And so I would have to get up because I would get my guys picks on the day of the game. And then I would log into whatever. I can't even remember the text messaging software that I was using at the time. And I would say, bet this game <laughs> at like oh, three yeah. o'clock in the morning Pacific. And then people would go and they would like bet the game. And then uh, it's probably like AOL Messenger or something like that. That's what I used in the affiliate world. Oh, really? Yeah. So we would have them. I, I can't even remember how we were driving traffic. Um, but I actually signed up for Russell Brunson's coaching program way back then. It was called Dot Com Secrets. Yeah. I don't know if you remember it. Yeah. So sure. I remember uh, I had a coach through there and he was teaching me about affiliate traffic and how to do affiliate deals. So yeah, there were a couple of other like, actually, I think they were like mainly like soccer related projects that I had going way back then. Um, but that helped me to learn, you know? So like all those failure, failures eventually led up to, you know, where we're at now. So I can totally relate to that story. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, failure is just a, it's a part of life. It's like, it's, you know, is it failure or is it just a learning experience? And it's, for me, sales management mastery was a very expensive learning experience. And to this day, I still have a credit card that I kind of keep on auto pay, mm -hmm. which I basically just, I paid for all my traffic on that. Just as a reminder, never to make stupid decisions like that. <laughs> There's only like a couple thousand dollars on it. It's on auto pay every single month. And it obviously yeah. it helps your credit rating too, believe it or not, when you have totally. something like that set up. Um, but yeah, don't jump into something and create an entire business unless you actually know people will buy from yep. you. <laughs> like I didn't create tier 11 under the, uh, under the impression that people would buy a service for me to run their ads on Facebook. I actually did it first a couple of times, did it in a couple of different ways, didn't charge a lot of money, like a hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, that was the, like I said, and then I remember the first time I charged somebody like $1,500, I was like, Oh my God. And then I charged somebody $2,800 and then it just kept going up and up from there. And you gain more and more experience. You can speak more confidently on it as you gain that experience. So all that was expensive and dollars and time, but was it really? I look at it as just experience, totally. you know? It's experience that I still rely on to this day. Like that lesson I learned about creating a massive product that nobody buys. I still talk to our customers at Tier 11 about that. I talk to our internal teams about that when we're thinking about other products. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's education all the way. And if you're, you know, if you're not <laughs> continuously learning, 
you're standing still and you're, the world is just going to pass you by. Especially um, this industry, you know, it's like dog years. So true. So, you true. know, there's a million Facebook ad agencies out there. Not a lot of them are very good, but you know, what mm, do you true. attribute a lot of your, um, your ability to just thrive in this super saturated market? Like, what do you attribute that? What are some of the things that you guys have done that have helped you to thrive? Well, you know, what kind of pisses me off is that, um, when the idea of a Facebook ad agency didn't mm-hmm. exist eight years ago. Yeah. So <laughs> like when we started, we were really the only ones. It was like me and Jason Horning and like a couple of others, literally. And now like there's hundreds and there's a lot of shitty ones. And the ones that probably come to us, uh, you know, are the ones that have tried those smaller ones and don't know what the hell they're doing. Yep. They get I think burned. there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of build your own agency programs out there that do a horrible job, yep. but it's a business opportunity. So, you know, people are selling those types of programs and, you know, I would say probably 30 or 40%, if not more of our listeners for perpetual traffic are either, you know, independent consultants or one man shows for agencies or agencies which is, which is fine. And I, I, you know, I love teaching about this stuff, but I also realized that, you know, they're kind of getting rich on my expertise. So why not come out with a product at some point in time, which we actually are, where we can actually teach them the right way. Mm -hmm. And there is enough out there for everyone, in my opinion. But I think the quality of a lot of the, you know, the single man shops, although there's plenty of brilliant Facebook marketers out there, I think it's, it's getting to the point where it's saturated. Um, and, but, you know, non-egotistically, I look back like seven or eight years ago, we were one of the first ones, if not the first one. Um, and, you know, now there's a lot out there in that market. But, uh, you know, we've chosen to stick with one thing and be really, really good at it and not be a, a full stack you know, every media just focus on these two platforms and obviously WhatsApp is going to have advertising on it this year and get really, really good at it because it's 3 billion users every month on these two platforms. It's crazy. So why not advertise on it? And, um, you know, thankfully we've been able to build a pretty good business around it. And in the process, I think I've helped a lot of people to, to either start their own businesses or to go out there and, and help people get the word out on Facebook. But, um, you know, quality is definitely still continues to be an issue, uh, you know, with um, some of the other agencies that we've talked to and it's, it's too bad. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a constantly changing platform and it's challenging, but that's what keeps us in it every single day and gets us excited about it, believe it or not. I know a guy, not going to say his name, um, and this is from somebody else, but, um, you know, one of his elite mastermind group, whatever people who has a legit business still, you know, like a one person company, but doing, you know, multiple six figures. He was talking to this guru guy who has thousands and thousands of clients. He's like, how many of your clients are actually doing like six figures? He's like, maybe 1%. Mm. And this guy's selling the dream, you know, with the Ferrari and everything. And I I was like, dude, like at what point do you like kind of, I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how you, I've never been in that business. I don't really understand it, but I mean, does the moral compass ever kick in and be like, like I got to change what I'm selling because nobody's getting the results that I'm promising them. You know what I mean? I mean, we run a hundred million dollars a year in ad spend. So we have legit, you know what it is, right? We've been doing this a long time, but because you're a practitioner. Yeah. Even that though, it's still hard. Yes. <laughs> even with all that experience, I can't imagine if the ad spend was one one hundredth or one one thousandth of that, how can you possibly get good at it? Totally. And I think right now, because it's so competitive, you know, and CPMs continue to go up on Facebook, um, you have to run a lot of ads to get good at it, which is like yeah. chicken or the egg, you know, are you going to run ads and then get good at it or run a lot of ads, get good at it, and then sell it? And I think there's, you know, it's, it's hard because there is an opportunity out there and there's still demand. Like every business, bricks and mortar or online needs Facebook advertising, um, in my opinion, just because it's such a great platform to introduce, you know, a product or service to people that they might otherwise not be aware of. Totally. So. We're running our own ads right now, you know, like 
we're actually getting a lot of opt-ins, but nobody's converting over to a demo. So, but you know, it's promising. At the end of the day, we haven't gotten a return on investment yet, but I'm, I'm very confident that we will. So I want to ask you a question, um, you know, because you've got a, you know, a decent sized team, big enough where you have a, a vice president of operations. And you've said that, you know, that that's one of the most important people on your team. Mm -hmm. um, when did you make the decision that, hey, I need this person in this leadership role, otherwise we're not gonna be able to grow? Yeah, I think the team size was probably about 10 people at that point in time. Uh -huh. um, uh, there's a law of threes, I forget exactly who, who coined this law, but every time you triple either in people or in revenue, shit breaks. <laughs> So from one to three, three to nine, nine to 27, and then whatever 27 times three is, um, 100, whatever it is. Yeah, I think um, it's 80, They're about 80, 80 81, right? Yeah. Um, so at every point, you have this breakage. And I, I was at that point where we had about nine employees, 10 employees, including myself, and the SOPs and the uh, the checklists and all the things that we had that were in place were no longer working like they did when we were three, four, five people. <laughs> I so, know exactly what you mean. I hope yeah. there's other people out there who can relate to this because this, what he's saying right now, what Ralph is saying right now is a hundred percent true. Yeah. And so you, uh, so my biggest thing when I was building, you know, tier 11, um, and we refer to it as a different name. You know, it's it, you know technically it's Antares Enterprises Inc., but nobody really likes that name. So we changed it to Tier Eleven, um, and rebranded ourselves. But you know, I think about at that point, uh, we were we were for me, I was sort of at the end of what I could do from an operational and um, logistics perspective. Like I had built it to that point, and I think we were. At about a million in revenue at mm -hmm. that point. I forget exactly which. I'd have to sort of go back in time. But anyway, we we're doing pretty well. But to get to that next level, I knew we had to scale out, obviously, the team. We had to continue to evolve our SOPs and our, you know, our standard operating procedures, our, our manuals, you know, our operating manuals, as I called them back then, and hire somebody, get somebody who could build out a team as well as think differently than I do and mm -hmm. think very operationally, much more logically, much more process driven. I do have sort of a process driven mind, but not to the degree of like a mechanical engineer or a software engineer. Mm -hmm. um, so we ended up hiring a, a guy, sort of merging his agency into ours, who is still with us to this day. And for me, that was a pivotal point because what he brought to the table was, was, was a set of skills or talents that I was good at, but not great at. I was never going to be great at it. And still to this day, like he is the process guy inside tier 11. And, you know, we have grown as a result of that. And then obviously added other pieces to it. But I think when you're hiring people, when you're looking for people, you want to hire people that are better than what you are in specific skills or areas of expertise. And that's how you really scale. And I think processes and like we were talking about with Chuck E. Cheese or with McDonald's is like systems, like creating systems as much as you can around what you do. Do it obviously to scale on your own, but at a certain point, you're probably going to need help unless you are that process driven person, a much more like visionary and CEO uh, mindset. So having him on board and continuing to have him on board has been a game changer for us for sure. That's awesome, man. Well, guess what? We're almost out of time. <laughs> this went by so much faster than the last time. Yeah, we only um, had a few tangents. That's all right, though. <laughs> tangents are good. Tangents are what make the interviews fun, in my opinion. Yeah, it's good. It's so, all good. Everyone wants um, to know about the shit brown on me. So, like, yeah, I don't, I, Actually, I don't even know what that car is. <laughs> it's so awful. <laughs> I'll, I'll text you a picture. <laughs> oh, awesome. All right. Well... Um, I know you got some cool programs coming out. You're going to be speaking at TNC. What is the best way for people to get in contact with you? Yeah. I mean, if you're at traffic and conversion summit, um, it'd be uh, great to meet you. If you're a listener to this show, definitely come see me speak. I forget which day I'm on. I think it's what's your topic. Two. Uh, we're talking about the, uh, the ads amplifier system, sort of the framework that we use to scale up ads to hundred million in ad spend. 
nice. uh, per year. So, and I think we're, I'm going to use a couple of case studies uh, in there as well. So, on uh, some some new sort of tweaks to it since the last time I spoke about it last year. Um, but we are actually going to be doing a, a program, a live program, whether it's one day or two day. We actually have it slotted for two days around TNC for agency owners. So we're actually going to get into this whole like agency build build your own agency thing, but in my opinion, do it the right way and tap into the stuff that we've been able to build over the course of the last 10 years, those systems, how we bring in customers, what our systems are, uh, and how we've been able to scale to where we're at right now and, and the ad spend that we manage. So that will be um, the days prior to TNC. I believe it's going to be on the 30th of March, but if people are interested in that, they can go over to, uh, tier11.com forward slash uh, work with us or just hit the big pink button and fill in your information and say interested in agency builder and we'll get in touch with you that way and give you early access. So Awesome, man. So um, who would be the perfect person to take advantage of that, the program, the agency builder program? Yeah, I think it's probably like guys that the guys that I was just ripping. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. actually, yeah, it is like if you if you have a you know if you're either running ads for companies as a single person, or maybe you have a small team, or maybe you've started to build out a team, like kind of where I was at, like you had six or seven or eight people, and you don't really know how to get to the next level. You know, those are the types of people I think we can really help. Um, this is obviously, you know, there is a, um, a business opportunity sort of in this, but from my perspective, the people that we're really able to help are, are already doing it, have some level of proficiency at running Facebook and Instagram ads, and then we can help you with that, but then also help you build and grow to get to the next level to scale. Perfect. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that like, you know, the, the ads people that I've met, like they always start off with a bang, like they go out and they get like 10 clients. And then after a couple months, like they are just struggling with retention, you know, because they don't have those processes. They don't know how to, you know, get the results that they need to be able to, to keep the clients happy and that sort of thing. So that's something you're going to be able to teach them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, customer retention is, um, is one of the biggest things I think we've been able to, to crack the code on. And, um, it's uh, it's a real challenge, especially if you're direct response and you're performance based like mm -hmm. we are, people expect a lot. So picking the right types of customers, I think is, is super important. We talk about that, how we actually do it, you know, our processes internally, like it starts with that, but then client management, how we actually go about keeping and retaining customers, keeping them happy and then, you know, helping them scale at the same time. So yeah, we'll, awesome, we'll be covering all that for sure. That's great. Well, Ralph, you are the man. I can't wait to see you when you come out here to San Diego. I'll buy you a beer or a Pretty tequila. Cool. Um, and to all of our listeners, thank you all for tuning in today and make sure that you return next Thursday and every Thursday for the next episode of Operation Agency Freedom. Bye guys.